Hobsville is comprised of three peninsulas and Maine's mid-coast. When the owner of the town's monthly newspaper, the Harpswell Anchor, retired and closed the paper, several residents worked to bring it back as a community-run, nonprofit newspaper. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to know, how did you start the Harpswell Anchor? A wing and a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having us and for accommodating us. Um, we are part of a Maine Humanities Council grant on exploring democracy and journalism and what to do about news deserts, uh, particularly in our town of Berwick, Maine. So obviously we want to find out if what you've done here at the Harpsoul Anchor can be done in Berwick and in other towns. So I'm wondering if we could start, if you could introduce yourself, starting with you, J.W., what you do here and your background, please. Uh, my name is J.W. Oliver. I'm the editor of the Harpswell Anchor. Um, I, for 11 years um, prior, I was at the Lincoln County News uh, in the Dan Rascotta area. Uh, I was, um, for, for my last five years there, I was the editor. Um, and uh, I was the uh, Maine Press Association Journalist of the Year a few years ago. Um, and I grew up here in Maine. In, in uh, South Bristol. Okay, Janice? I'm Janice Thompson. Um, my husband and I and my daughter moved to Harpswell only about four years ago. Um, I'm a career um, development professional fundraising. I have about 33 years of um, advancing the missions of places like um, MIT and Harvard in the Boston area, the Boston Athenaeum. Um, I did some consulting and uh, then we moved up here and I did some work with a land trust and was one of the founders of, of this paper. Thank you. And Greg? My name is Greg Bestick. Um, I'm the president of the board of the Harpswell Anchor. I've been coming into this area part-time for over 20 years. Um, bought a house up here in Harpswell in 2015. I've been full-time up here for two years. My background is I've been an executive in education and technology and entertainment companies over the years. And um, I retired two years ago and I've been spending uh, most of my free time working with these <laughs> fine people in the Harpswell Anchor. Greg, how many hours are you putting in maybe a week? I would estimate um, 20 hours a week. That's about a half-time job for me. I'm actually 80% of a full-time position. Um, that said, we are we have been in startup mode since, since June, and um, I would say like sometimes 60 hours. Um, we are working though toward the, the 80%. Now that we're sort of getting, we're more up and running, I'm going to be doing 40 or 80% time. That's the goal. Yes. <laughs> and JW? Um, I'm, I'm a full-time 40-hour uh, employee here, and I, I work, uh, you know, a little over full-time. Full Okay. I'd like to know about the Harpswell Anchor. Can you talk about it, how often it comes out, who gathers the news, who gets the advertising or sponsors? J.W., can you start as editor? Tell, tell us what you do to, to get the news out. Yes, the Harpswell Anchor comes out monthly, the print edition. Um, we have a website that we update regularly throughout the month. Um, I, uh, as editor, I, I'm all, I also do the, uh, the bulk of the reporting, but we do work with um, a number of freelance contributors, um, reporters, as well as columnists. Um, and um, that's, uh, that's, that's been one of our, um, one of our challenges of late is, is finding, uh, finding uh, more contributors. What kind of stories do the contributors write? News or other information? Well, I'd like to find contributors who have experience in reporting the news um, who, can, who can assist me with that. Um, uh, most of our contributors, they write columns or, or features. Um, we have a couple that do some reporting. Um, and, uh, but most, most, for the most part, freelancers, they have um, other uh, other jobs, other commitments, and uh, so availability becomes a, uh, becomes a challenge as well. I understand it's mailed out, free, free of charge. Uh, yes, we mail it to every address in Harpswell. Um, we uh, mail a small number to uh, seasonal residents at their um, off-season addresses. Um, and we uh, distribute the paper to stores uh, throughout Harpswell 
um, as well as uh, select locations in a few surrounding towns. So people don't sign up and subscribe, they get it if they have a mailing address in town. Whether they like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Janice, what about the sponsorships? I sure, I, I just wanted to add also that um, that they, that we do have subscriptions. We have about 250 people who we mail it out, you know, first class, the, what JW was talking about, the seasonal residents. Do they pay? Well, that's an interesting question because um, they do and they don't. We are, because we're a nonprofit, our subscription, so we can, you can mail it to anybody in the country. We actually have a couple of Canadians too, and it's free. Um, we, and it's, it's supported by tax deductible donations. So people can sign up and then we say, well, you know, do you want to make a donation? Some of them do and some of them don't. Um, but we just did, uh, you know, they're, they're giving, we did an analysis and they're giving about, the group is giving about three times as much, as many donations as it would, it costs us to mail them out. Is it getting in more donations and sponsorships than, is it covering the cost? Oh yes. Again, it's it's we're it's the we're bringing in three times as much as it costs. So if we had priced them at a at a certain number, people probably would have given that amount. But we decided that it's because it's a service. We're a nonprofit. It's free, and if you want to make a tax deductible donation, that's fine. So it's it's working out that way. And what's the feedback been from residents for the new Harpswell anchor? Universally fabulous right yeah I would have say you heard that. anything negative i've not heard anything negative people will when they hear that you're involved with the anchor will come up and say thank you you know that's the major response we get because when the paper uh stopped publishing back in 2020 people really realized that that was a huge void in this community uh the way this community is laid out geographically it's it's three spits of land that end in casco bay and there is really no center to the town so without a local newspaper, it's very, very difficult for, for the town to connect. And so the, the gratitude, I'd say, is the primary um, initial reaction. And then after that, because of the journalistic job that JW is doing, people are very impressed with the coverage that uh, they're getting out of the local community now. It's different. The coverage is a little bit different now. Uh, yeah. We did a reader survey to, I think we had about 5,000 people um, last spring before we started. Uh, to see what they liked about the old anchor, what they didn't like, what they wanted in the new anchor. Uh, the old anchor was really focused on features, on, on you know, stories about people, um, you know, the Girl Scouts, different things like that. Um, we, ha we do more news. So JW covers the school board, selectmen's meetings. Um, what else would you call news news? I mean, we have news briefs. Uh, so it's, a li it's different. And I noticed a Maine Humanities Council grant helps support news coverage, is that right? I saw that in one of the editions. That's right, we've, re we've, received, um, we've received a few grants um, thanks, to, thanks to our, we have a volunteer, uh, we have a volunteer committee of grant writers essentially um, and uh, supported by Janice. Um, and uh, we, one of those grants was uh, from the Maine Humanities Council, um, the same program um, that is supporting your project, and that's supporting uh, our coverage of, of, of town government and the town meeting process, um, so it fits into that democracy and journalism idea. How many people then, all together, would you say are helping to get the Harpswell Anchor out each month? I mean, how many well, people are Well, our board, involved? we have 10 people on the board. Yeah. Uh, we have about 15 people in our volunteer group. Um, they help stuff envelopes and come, you know, if we have events, they help with events, uh, things like that. We have how many freelancers, I think, total? I mean, I guess they're not volunteers, they're paid people. Right. I'm not sure, maybe maybe 10. They Not, not all people who contribute every month, but um, I'd say about 10 people who contribute at least on occasion. I didn't answer your question about sponsors. I went off. I went off track. So, do you want me to answer that question sure. about the sponsorship? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, because we're a nonprofit organization, we get our revenue through donations, um, advertised sponsored ads, and uh, sponsorships and grants. Uh, the business model of, especially print papers, 
being supported by advertising is, uh, is not working. It's one of the reasons why a lot of the papers are folding. As a nonprofit, we can raise tax-deductible individual gifts as well. Um, with the sponsors, we, have, we, we strive for about 40% of the total column inches for each paper uh, to be supported by sponsored ads. Um, and that, that we've hit that mark pretty much the whole time. Uh, we raise anywhere between $8,000 and $10,000 for each month um, from, from sponsorship, from sponsored ads. Those come from local businesses and they also come from the local nonprofits and the town. As Greg was saying, uh, when the old anchor folded, there was really, it really was a desert. And the, the nonprofits did realize this is our main way of getting our information out there. The town, too. Uh, so they, they, they're really our backbone. We pretty much get, I think, an ad from local places like we have Harpswell Aging at Home um, and the churches and the land trust. Um, they are pretty much in there every, every month. And how many issues have you produced so far? Nine. Started in June last year. So yes. six last year, seven last year, and uh, one every month this year. Yeah. Um, which leads me, I'd like to know the story of how this got started. <laughs> well, Could I tell the story? Please. Okay. Um, yes. So a lot of us were involved with the old anchor. Um, I wrote for the anchor. Um, and a couple of other people did as well. When it folded, uh, we did, you know, there were a lot of concerned people. And, and so we put together a sort of a brainstorming session of, of maybe 15 people to sort of say, well, what, what can we do about this? You know, not committing to anything, just brainstorming. And out of that, it was, it was amazing because everybody around the table, around the Zoom table, sort of said, okay, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. So we, we started sort of exploring what the different business models were. And we talked about a number of different things. We talked about, you know, maybe partnering with the Times Record or maybe just going online or, um, you know, finding a buyer for, for, you know, we had a whole lot of different choices. And we discovered the, this organization called the Institute for Nonprofit News in Washington, D.C. Um, it's a membership organization that supports papers just like ours. And they're uh, just a wealth of information. And through that connection, we learned that this nonprofit model is the wave of not only the, the current day, but of the future. A lot of uh, the, it's happening around the country. Did that surprise you to learn that? That, I mean, that this I, was a I, trend? Uh, it surprised me. I'm not a journalist, so I had no idea. Um, were we surprised? I think From a business perspective, it, it kind of makes sense because you realize that the, the local ad model, as Janice said, isn't really sustainable in small communities. So you have to have multiple sources of funding. And if you can offer you know, the tax-deductible benefits of a not-for-profit organization, you've got the opportunity to bring in funding from a lot more different sources, from individual donors in the community, from businesses, and from, uh, from organizations as well. Is that sustainable, Greg? I was wondering, you started up, everybody's excited. People are putting in money and time. But five years down the road, what, what do you see happening? I think what we, we thought a lot about this. It's a great question. We thought a lot about it when we started. And what we realized is that a lot of these um, local non-for-profit news organizations had gotten started with grants. And we didn't feel that as a smaller organization, grants was a sustainable way to, to fund and sustain this over time. Because it's hit or miss whether you're going to get the grant. You know, the timing is often not in your control. And often foundations want uh, organizations with bigger reach than, say, a local news organization would have. And so we determined that we were going to rely on the local community. We knew the local community wanted the paper, and we knew we could get um, donors. Also, this is a fairly wealthy community because it's an oceanfront community. So there are the funds here to support a local paper. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, as Janice said, we, we knew the local business community and the local government, et cetera, would also support the paper to an extent. So we built a model that basically said, we'll get 40% of our revenue essentially from advertising, you know, traditional sponsorships advertising, and 60%, you know, or 50% from donors, 
And then if we get some grants, great. You know, that's good, but that will be gravy on top. It is, it, that is the challenge though, from a fundraising point of view, that, that as, a, as a, a, a career fundraiser, I've gone into organizations and they've said, okay, we wanna do a campaign or we wanna do an annual fund and let's do a feasibility study about, you know, will this work? And we didn't, I, I didn't even have to do that because of what we knew about the community. And it was such a, it was such a backbone of the community. And after we also did this mailing, I mean, we got, we mailed it out to 5,000 people. I think we got 750 responses back, which is unheard of with a, uh, with a mailed uh, questionnaire. Uh, so it was sort of a no brainer, I think from, from my perspective, from a fundraising point of view. That said, we, we are the shiny new keys in town. And, we, and it is part of our development and our marketing plan to make sure that we, we message well enough. So we, we want to make sure that we are messaging, that people understand that it is a nonprofit and that it requires that, that annual support. Um, and so we have that in our mind and in our plan to make sure that we, we get that, that message across. But that, that in the, the, the origin story, that reader survey was really important to get that to get that feedback and to know that people I mean one of our questions was we had somebody on the board who said I we don't want to do this as a fundraising ask you know here's this this questionnaire um, but we did say you know do you want to get involved with with fundraising and a lot of people said you know I'll I'll pay for it you know charge us we should you know so so that was pretty clear it was a, um, a very busy spring because we, we really wanted to get out there in, in, in front of summer because this is a, you know, that the population doubles in the summer. And so, um, but we, we were talking with Bob Anderson, the, the owner and the editor of the last paper, um, to get the, the, the um, intellectual capital, to buy the intellectual capital and the brand from him. And it took him a little bit of time to sort of figure out that he really did want to fold 100% because he had a choice of starting up again, you know, in a couple of months. Um, and so by the time we realized that he wanted, that the, we, we got that deal done to when we published, it was a six week period. And we really couldn't go out and start raising money or, you know, getting sponsorships without knowing that we're going to do a paper. Doug Warren, who is our, our vice president of the, of the board, is a career editor. He was an editor at the Boston Globe and in other places in Texas. Um, he actually edited. We didn't even have JW yet. We didn't even have an editor. So Doug did the, the editing for the first, um, and we scrambled, you know, with trying to get some sponsors. We call them now the founding sponsors because they took a chance on us. Um, so that was really, really a scramble and a lot of fun, too. So I imagine for you, as a, um, with your background in marketing and development, I can see where you need s this type of person to step in. I was absolutely going to say that as a one of the way we really, really lucked out was having Janice involved in this because, you know, her professionalism and her level of uh, skill at this is something that you're just not going to find in most most uh, organizations like this. And we're actually finding that with with the other INN members. Um, that most of them are run by journalists, and um, this INN organization helps them do the fundraising, but it's sort of like fundraising 101, you know, teaching journalists about how to do fundraising, and the editors are focused on editing. So this partnership between the two of us works really well because there's a firewall between content and revenue. So for example, everybody, we don't have anonymous donors because we don't want it to look like people are, you know, going behind the scenes and, and, and affecting content. The revenue that comes in has no relevance in content. So if someone says to me, oh, I want to give you a donation and I would really like you to do this story, I would say, I'll take your donation and you have to talk to JW about the story. And so that's really important. Uh, so it's, it, it, it is, what JW and I do, the both of us, often one person does. And that's one of the things, if you want to have that checklist about what you need for success, is those two functions should really be separate. And to have that firewall. And to have the firewall. If you charge subscriptions, can you still be a nonprofit? Yes, because especially because we're not charging for subscriptions. It's it, there for free. 
But, I, but if you did, if you decided to raise funds by, people are saying, we'll pay for it, mm -hmm. a dollar a paper, would that help? What did Kate tell us about the fact that it's free is good? Um, you can, you can, to answer your question, you can charge and still be non-for-profit, but the funds have to go toward your mission, as it's stated in your 50C3 1C3 application. And um, everybody is sort of looking at different revenue models. We felt that the donor model was better for us. And frankly, we could raise more money by, you know, getting local people to contribute than by charging a specific amount for each paper. Greg, I want to ask you about donations. You said there, uh, Harpswell is a wealthy community because it's on the ocean. But with there being this summer resident, year-round resident, where are the donations coming from? Are, is it mostly the year-round residents, or is it everybody? I'm wondering if you can give us an idea. Well, uh, fortunately, uh, Janice had the foresight to set up uh, something called Little Greenlight, which is a donor database. Mm -hmm. So we have a very good record of who donates and where the money comes from. I think she would know better than I what the details are, but but effectively, uh, we're getting support. You know, at the at the very smaller levels, you know, ten dollar, twenty five dollar donations, and then donations in the thousands as well. Mm -hmm. So it really is across the spectrum of the community, and it's both the local residents and and the people who come in for the summer. In twenty twenty one, it was actually we were surprised that there were there were so many gifts from the seasonal residents. It's about 40% of the total. Um, and those, it's very interesting because the, 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 a lot of our seasonal residents come here and, and feel part of the community and they want to be connected to that community even in the winter time. It's not, I mean, you know, it's hard, I don't want to stereotype, but a lot of people don't, they're not coming here and just you know, saying, I, I'm just, I'm going to look at the ocean and I'm not going to be involved. Yeah. It's, it's, we don't have a lot of people like that, at least in, in, in our experience and reaching out. Uh, so it's, it's just been really interesting. We have people, we're mailing papers to people who don't even live here anymore, wow. but they want to be connected. So. Are summer folks just people who haven't retired yet and been able to come up here so they consider this? He's, he's a poster child for that. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Yeah, for years uh, we'd come up here and, and spend the month of August up here, and but we always knew that this is where we wanted to end up. So I think a lot of people like me just love it up here. They feel very drawn to the area, and then as they wind down their business careers, then they kind of migrate in on a full-time basis. It's an, it's uh, on a median age basis. It's an older community. I think it's one of the oldest communities in the state. Yeah, and Maine is trending older anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. we're the we have the our residents have a the oldest median age in, in Maine, and Maine has the oldest median age in the country. What is the median age? Do you know in Harpswell? Here, fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Yeah. It's something like that. Yeah. Well, J.W., what attracted you to the Harpswell anchor and leaving Lincoln? Boy, um, <clears throat> I, have, I have to think back a little bit, but uh, the nonprofit model was exciting to me. Um, you know, I, I spent the first 11 years of my career at a traditional legacy newspaper that struggled with um, with print, with print, with with trying to uh, with trying to be sustainable um, on on that old model of. Uh, uh, you know, most of your revenue coming from print advertising. Um, it's uh, it's not it's not it's very difficult for newspapers uh, to compete in uh, an environment where a business can purchase an an ad uh, through um, Facebook or Google and target target it very specifically, um, geographically, um, demographically. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard and, and, and those ads um, are often more inexpensive than uh, a newspaper ad. So it's, it's, it's hard for newspapers to compete in that way. Um, and uh, the, so I was, I was interested, uh, it, it sparked my curiosity, the nonprofit model, um, as far as the sustainability of local news, um, and, um, and I, you know, I, I haven't thought about this for a while. I think also you wanted to write more too. 
Yes, yes, that's true. Um, I was very interested in, um, I had, uh, you know, after five years as editor, I'd primarily become a, a manager, an administrator, um, and I was very interested in being hands-on um, with reporting and writing again. Um, so that was, that was a big attraction to me. Um, but I have to say, um, to say that the, the financial part of this is, um, is very important and, and the partnership that, that Janice mentioned um, because I could, you know, I have, I have a young family. I could not have come down here if they said, if they said, uh, we want to start a new nonprofit newspaper. We want you to come run it for us. We don't have any idea how we're going to do it. Um, that would not have been feasible for me. But when they interviewed me, they said, you know, we think we've raised enough. We think we've raised enough money to operate for a year. And uh, based on that and everything else I heard, um, that said to me that it was, um, it was uh, a, 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 maybe still a gamble in some sense, but one that I was uh, comfortable taking. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and I, I've, I'm enjoying, uh, you know, I lo love Harpswell. Um, I've loved getting to know the community. Um, I grew up about an hour away, but was not familiar with the Harpswell community, um, really, really whatsoever. Um, it's somewhere that you have to seek out. Um, you know, it's not somewhere that you would ever drive through. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, I'm enjoying it. So you wanted to do more writing, and now you're doing both writing and putting out of, and editing and doing a, a lot. It seems I looked at the paper. You have a lot of stories in there. And what are you covering when, when you said you're looking for somebody to do more, I take it, more night meetings, uh, like do selectmen meet at night, planning board? What do, what do you cover? Yes, the, the select board, the planning board, the school board. Um, the, uh, lately I've been interviewing um, candidates for the legislature. We have a, um, the uh, state representative from Harpswell who's termed out. Um, who, who's, who's, serving, who's serving her final term and can't run again. And uh, there, there's a very, um, very active race. Um, I've interviewed three candidates so far and just learned of two more um, that are entering that race. So there's going to be competitive primaries in both parties. Um, you know, that's something that I've been uh, spending a significant amount of time on. Um, we have a competitive school board race. Um, the school board uh, has uh, you know, well, school boards across the country have uh, have become more um, uh, more contentious, I think, than usual because of uh, COVID nineteen protocols and um, uh, some uh, uh, some pushback against uh, diversity and equity, uh, uh, including uh, diversity and equity in. Uh, in, in education, um, and uh, the uh, the school the school board here um, has had um, has had very um, very very divisive uh, meetings um, that, that last for hours and hours, and um, and uh, and a lot of interest uh, in the election as well as another vacancy that's come up on the school board. So it's it's uh, the school board has. Um, uh, probably attracted as, as much attention as anything. Well, I want to ask about the controversial story. <clears throat> Greg said the former Harpswell anchor, so did, or maybe it was Janice, excuse me, tended to cover the features. Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about diversity issues, and which is hugely controversial nationwide. Mm -hmm. do, do you shy away from that? Are you into it? Do you just put it out there? Is your coverage the same as it would be, you know, if you were working for any newspaper? I think we're we're uh, you know at a at a small town level we're gonna we're going to uh, we're going to cover the news uh, the same way um, any responsible newspaper would, um, you know, and uh, and we're going to we're going to cover it in in a professional. Uh, in a professional way, in an objective way, but we're not going to shy away from difficult issues. Um, we haven't gotten too much into the uh, into the diversity and equity um, uh, uh, question, but we have covered a couple of contentious uh, issues with the school board having to do with uh, having to do with uh, mask mandates in the schools, having to do with um, 
uh, sort of sex education. Um, uh, so um, <laughs> some of these debates from, you know, from 20, 30, 40 years ago that are uh, st starting to resurface. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, so no, so no, we're uh, we're not going to we're not going to shy away from controversial issues, but we're going to cover them fairly and objectively. And I think that's I think that's a really big point, and and it goes to sort of the subject of what you're talking about, democracy and journalism. Um, we all know what's happening with the media across the country, and we're so divided, and we have to we have to work to think about what's a fact and what's not a fact. And so we're in this, you know, this small community, but we like to think that we're setting up a model for actual nonpartisan and impartial news. And that's very difficult to do in a, in a time when we can't agree on facts. Um, but JW has done a wonderful job. One of the things that we were worried about is that Everybody on the board and everybody on the staff was, we're sort of from away, you know, we, some of us have some roots into the community, but we're not, we're not one of those multi-generational families. And then JW comes from, from away. And we were worried that people were gonna be like, no, you're gonna come in and change Harpswell and you're gonna, you're not gonna understand Harpswell and all of that. He has done an amazing job with with getting involved with the community, he has already made, you know, he, he's garnered a lot of respect. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons is because he's impartial. Um, and, and it's interesting, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you a little vignette that you can, might take out, but one of the things that, that he did was at the school board, there was, a, there was controversy about this, a, a health questionnaire that went out to all the students. And if you hear what was happening at the board level, and we were listening, they were saying, oh, this is, you know, this is asking our kids about their sex lives and their drug use and their, this is so unfair. And there was all this conversation going back and forth. And so JW decided that he's just gonna go and actually look at the questionnaire and, and to see what they're actually asking. And then he reported on that. And so you can sort of, we don't necessarily have to, to um, curate the news, you know, just putting out the information, then let, letting people figure it out for themselves. That's what we're trying to do. Instead of saying, this is good, this is bad, we're going to take this position, we're not going to listen to you. We really try to, 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 to listen to or to report on different perspectives. It sounds like the school board could fill up the entire newspaper from, from the stories you're talking about. Um, I notice you have many letters to the editor, so people must be responding to what you're writing, but there's no editorials. Was that a decision that was made among all of you with the board? Why don't you have editorials in the paper? Um, it, was, it was a conscious decision. Um, we, um, a, at least at this point, we have decided not to um, write editorials. We, there are some limits. Um, there are some limits on what we can do as a nonprofit. Um, we cannot endorse candidates, uh, for, for instance, uh, and that's not something that I would want to do anyway. Um, but uh, you know, we we really we really want the community to see us as an objective news source. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back for a second to the to the um, story that Janice mentioned, and, and we, published, we published that uh, homework assignment. We, um, we requested it and then had to, uh, we had to file a request with the school district under the uh, Maine Freedom of Access Act to obtain that homework assignment. Um, um, so we had, to, we had to force their hand a little bit um, because they didn't want to um, turn it over. Um, but uh, we, we published it uh, wholesale on our website. And, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't us saying to the community, uh, this is good, this is bad, this member of the board is right, this member of the board is wrong. It was saying, um, see, see this. See this for yourself. And uh, you know, one thing that they might have seen is that um, the comments from some of the board members about what that assignment wa was um, were not accurate. Um, and so that's that's a key role of a newspaper is to combat misinformation. And it's a key. Uh, it's a problem that occurs in news deserts because. Um, 
what what steps in to fill the gap is um, often social media and there's um, and, and 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 the rumor mill um, and uh, there's no um, the, the the same standards are are obviously not applied there I think it's very important to have um, to have a professional journalist, I think I think um, volunteers volunteers can do good work. Um, freelancers can do good work, but it's important to have um, a professional journalist who understands um, the uh, the principles that journalists are supposed to follow. Um, the um, the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics and uh, the Associated Press has a, um, um, a very lengthy uh, statement of, of of principles and ethics. And um, you know, I'm very well studied on those things and uh, very careful about um, objectivity and um, and um, ethical considerations and so forth. I'm glad you explained that. Are you saying you had to file a FOIA request for a homework assignment? Yes, that's correct. And as you said, what would have happened if the Harpswell anchor hadn't been here to do that? Well, the um, the statements at the board meeting would have gone um, would have gone uncontested. That would have been the community's um, unless you were a parent of a student who had who had reviewed the assignment for yourself. Uh, that would have been the totality of your understanding of the situation where some, um, you know, some, uh, frankly, uh, well, uh, incorrect, incorrect statements uh, by board members about um, what the assignment was. And again, we're not here to say the assignment was appropriate, inappropriate, or otherwise. We're just here to say this is what it was. Okay. Um, I'd like to change gears a little bit, unless somebody wants to comment on that. I just want to jump, uh, just sure, sure. add on to that uh, one thing. There have been several studies now done by independent organizations about what happens to communities when they lose their local news outlet. And time and again, what they found is, um, to, to reinforce what JW was saying, is that the level of civic discourse gets more contentious and the level of civic engagement goes down. So absent information, ten bad things tend to happen to communities. And JW brought up social media, which leads me to the demographics of Harpswell, and you said it's older people. Are you engaging with younger people? Are school-age kids reading the Harpswell Anchor? Are people in their 20s? Or who's reading the paper? Do you know? Well, to your first question, um, you can talk about our, our school correspondent. You have a school correspondent. Uh, sure. Yes, we do have. Uh, we have a senior at the high school. Um, the high school is actually the Harpswell students attend is in Topsom, Mount Ararat High School. Um, we have a, a senior uh, who lives in Harpswell and writes a monthly column for the newspaper. Um, you know, we've we're, we're we're making an effort to reach out to younger people. You know, um, I interviewed a couple of uh, uh, of um, kids who live here in Harpswell and who uh, traveled to the, um, it's not the Little League World Series, but a, a similar uh, uh, um, uh, national, comp national baseball competition uh, in Florida, uh, interviewed and did a story about their experience. We're making an effort. I, I think that uh, our primary uh, demographic is, in, and certainly we're, we're in an older community, um, most of our readers are probably older, but um, we, we do, uh, uh, we we're, we're trying to bring in younger readers and to make them a part of the anchor. Yeah, the, the demographics do tend toward older people, but they love reading about the kids. Um, JW took a number of photographs where we had, I think it was Cundy's Harbor Days last August, and you know they had these little kids in, in bathing suits jumping from one box to another. I mean, it was, and people loved them. They loved them. We have um, a board member who in the summertime writes a column about what to do with your grandchildren um, in the summertime. Um, we had somebody just send in a, a news brief, wanted to announce that his, um, his daughter got on the dean's list for a school, a college in, in Massachusetts. Uh, so I don't think I don't think any young people are reading papers. You know, quite frankly, we have a 24-year-old administrative assistant who who keeps us honest just in terms of that. He's sort of from a different world, um, but yeah. So I, I think that that no, we don't have a lot of readers, but we're trying to engage families more. I know, engage them. I ask because, of course, the the older we are, the more we remember the regular 
newspaper that you read when it was delivered, not online. And the younger people do tend to be more on the social media, getting information that way. So I'm wondering for the up and coming generations, I mean, do you expect that when these people get older, they're still going to want the Harpswell Anchor? Well, one of the things we've been doing is, as we started the paper back up, you know, there was a very strong sentiment in the community to have a print edition. So we definitely started with a print edition, and that's where the bulk of our efforts went. But we also um, made a much more robust online presence than the old anchor ever had. And over time, we're continuing to build and add on to that. You know, for instance, we built an online not-for-profit corner where all the, the local not-for-profits in the community can put information and, uh, and can reach out to their constituencies. And so we see this um, as an evolving process. And we're not sure exactly what the timing of the evolution is going to be, but we know we have to keep chips down in both of these camps for now, the print side and the online side. And the online Which side. We, were, we were advised when we did a, a little bit of market research with mm -hmm. other newspapers in Maine, or in, even across the country, you don't want to start up a, a print paper today. You know, it's just not going to work. But in this community, it does. Again, and we knew that. That was our assumption, but we tested that assumption with this reader survey. Um, and I think it was something like 92% said they wanted a print paper. So we're like, we're going to do a print paper. But it's a good question about the future. You know, what is in five years and 10 years? It probably will go online um, eventually. And that's why I know Greg is, is often bringing that long-term perspective to, to us to remember that this is not just now, we, we need to build for the future as well. We put a, together this year one of the board committees. We have several committees of the board, and one of them is an online working group. And so the, the task of that group this year is going to be to create a strategic plan, looking out at our online future over the next you know, three to five years. I'm wondering if you work with other news, well, information organizations in town, such as the local library or the Harpswell Community Television to get out information and news? Um, yes. Uh, we, um, we, we, we have very close relationships with a lot of those organizations. Um, and we're still sort of trying to work out how, I mean, we're not in formal collaboration like with the, the, the TV station and, and all of that, but we, we do work together with, with other nonprofits to, to do that. We have um, specifically Des, des, decided that it's going to be a hyper local paper and so we don't write about things that are going on outside you know even in Brunswick and Bath unless they have a Harpswell connection um, and there has been talk about well maybe we should um, but then you know we already have a paper in Brunswick that's sort of covering all of those things so we don't what can we bring that's going to be added value uh, so that's by design that we we focus on Harpswell news. Well, which brings me, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just say that we do, we are, um, we are in a coalition of nonprofits that includes the Cundis Harbor Library um, that is working on a project um, that essentially trying to uh, um, educate the community about uh, the working waterfront. Um, so that is uh, yeah. just one example of how we're working with one of the, the libraries here in town. That collaboration that JW talked about, it is, it's, it, we all, there's also a connection with the, land, the local land trust, Harpswell Heritage Land Trust, and the Maine, Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. And that also brings up that, you know, that is a series of articles, but it's also a series of um, panel discussions. We, if you look at our mission, we don't say that we run a, a newspaper. We say that we're an information source that builds community. Uh, so, so we do run the paper, but we're also, our, our plan is to do more of those collaborations through um, maybe events or salon discussions or um, things like that. So we look at ourselves more broadly than sort of just a newspaper. Okay. I should have asked this earlier, but you talked about the demographics of the town, at least the logistics of the town. There are three, can you describe that? Three peninsulas? How do you cover everything and does each have its own little town government or how does the town government work? Well, there are, <clears throat> there's a central town government, but there are 216 miles of coastline just in Harpswell. 
And uh, there are three peninsulas, basically, that uh, the town is divided in with bodies of water between those peninsulas. So as we were saying earlier, if uh, you took a boat, you know, you could get over from here to Bailey's Island in maybe 10 minutes. But if you drive, it's going to take you over half an hour. It's going to take you over 40 minutes to get to Cundy's Harbor. And um, there's no sort of central downtown. I mean, this is the closest where you are right now. And so they're very happy. It's a hopping downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and then if, if you see, uh, look at the layout of each of these peninsulas, there's a central road that goes down the middle. And then off to the side, there are all these, you know, smaller roads and dirt roads that go off into the woods. So it's very difficult. <clears throat> to um, assemble the community or to go through the community in any kind of easy way to see who's there and what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, JW, did you find when you came here that each peninsula has its own uh, concerns, issues, or are, is, are they all connected? I'm just wondering what it's like. I'd say there are, um, there are differences um, culturally and economically um, between the different areas of town. Um, you know, I think, for example, uh, the, the Condé Harbor area of town, uh, I, I, you know, uh, I don't have statistics to, uh, to back this up, but uh, my, my impression is that it's, it's more conservative, it's more working class, um, it's, it's, a, it's a large, they have a large uh, a fishing port, um, and uh, um, the um, you know other other parts of town um, you know that that's 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 just an example. I'd say that each each part of town um, has its has its own character, and really, probably Janice or Greg could answer that question better than me because they know the community better. Is it hard to cover though when you know each, or you just try to get cover everything? I mean, I wouldn't say um, I wouldn't say hard to cover, uh, but um, I do I do make an effort to um, to cover stories from each part of the community. Uh, we don't want to be uh, we don't want to be an Orris Island newspaper or a Harpswell Neck newspaper or a Cundy Harbor newspaper. We want to be uh, a Harpswell newspaper that covers all of those communities. There was a feeling with the older newspaper, the the one that um, that uh, stopped publication that they were based here in the Harpswell Neck and that they were mostly focused on Harpswell Neck issues to the you know, detriment of the Oars Bailey's Island community or the Cundy's Harbor community. Because that paper was run by one editor. Yeah. And so if you have one person, no matter who he or she is, you, you, they focus on what they know. Um, and, and that's one of the benefit of having a board who, who represent, who live in those different areas. Um, and also just having, you know, we put out, you know, we put out calls for story ideas and anybody can send in story ideas. We, we really do try to cover uh, everybody because that was one of the things that people really wanted. Okay. Well, after doing this now for some months, um, and st uh, we failed to mention this got going under COVID, which I'm sure had its own challenges. What would you say you've learned is needed if you were going to recommend, you know, if, if another town such as Berwick came to you and said, hey, we're, we're starting from scratch here. We didn't really have a local newspaper. What have you found is important that maybe, you know, we wouldn't know about? Yeah, I think, and this is what we get this question a lot, and there are a number of things, but I think the number one requirement is having to do with human capital. Um, I have been in many circumstances in the past where, you know, I, I get together with a group of people and say, well, there's, there's this problem or we could do this and everybody wrings their hands and they say, oh, this is a horrible problem, but we don't have enough time to do it. Um, so again, going back to that first planning meeting, there were business people, there were career journalists, there was a fundraiser, there were people who were in nonprofits, this grant writer, um, what else? Marketing, um, design. You know, there were people who came, who, who brought to the table those skills and had the time to, to devote those skills. I mean, it was really run by this founders group until JW came in June. Um, and that's been extraordinary. Um, and 
I think for all the things, again, the checklist that you'd go through, I think that would be the hardest thing to find in, in communities because without that, you just, you're, you're dead in the water. And because we're a retirement community, you know, we have people who have really good skills and they have time. Um, so I, I think that's, and, and for me personally and professionally, it's been the most rewarding job that I've had because of the people who I'm working with and everybody is pulling their weight and I'm learning from other people all the time. Yeah, of course you need an office physical space, Janice. Are you willing to share <laughs> where, about where the Harpswell Anchor is done? <laughs> sure. <laughs> We're laughing because we don't have an office. But, well, we do. So we we had the, the, the chance to, to buy the original anchor building at the time. We were we were an experiment so that we, we didn't want to go ahead and do that. Um, it's actually operating out of my home uh, right now. Uh, JW and Sam Allen, who's our admin, um, and I, we all work from home, um, but when we need to be together, like during the layout of the paper, we do it, we do it here. We have an office in, in, in this place. Um, but you yourselves have seen today how sometimes difficult it is to get onto this property. Um, so we are at this point sort of just exploring the possibility of getting a, a physical space, um, maybe renting a space and not going, going ahead and buying it. Um, but so far, it's worked. It's worked pretty well. Can I uh, add on to that? Uh, your question about what it takes to get something like this up and running. There's an organization called Lion, which stands for Local Independent Online News, and they're a consortium of over 400 um, local news entities and organizations. And they've done a study about what it takes to be successful in this context. And they came up with a sort of a three-legged stool that you need. Uh, the first one is operational resilience. You know, so you have to have people who understand how to put a business together and all the pieces and parts of that. The second is financial health, which, you know, which seems obvious, but it's as we were talking earlier, figuring out what your business model is, then figuring out how to, a way to execute it so that it's sustainable over time. And then the third is journalistic impact and just making sure you're putting out something that uh, resonates with your local community. And you really, and their, their point is that if you have only two of those or any one of those, you're, you're probably not going to sustain yourself in the long term. And I think we're very fortunate in this community and in terms of how we've been able to get ourselves organized, basically because of the human capital that Janice was talking about, that we have all three pillars. And they're all, they're all intertwined as well. I mean, to, you know, raising money is, is, is like sales, but it's just not, you know, a tax deductible. To have a product that is so good and that people, I mean, people are saying now they, they read it cover to cover. I think I've heard that from yeah. 20 people, whereas they used to just sort of like look at the front page, but they say, I read it from cover to cover. And they say it's, it's well written and it's wonderful. And I don't have to worry about that. You know, JW is the one who puts together the product, but then it's wonderful as a salesperson or as a fundraiser to be able to say, this is what, you know, help us continue to, 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 to do this for the community. And so it's fundraising gold. It really is. That's great. Um, do you feel that residents are more informed because of the Harpswell Anchor? Absolutely. That, and, and more involved in town government? Absolutely. Yes. D take, the, take the school board, going back to the school board. You know, we don't have, we used to have two schools here and now we only have one K, K through eight school. Um, because the demographics and we don't have as 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 many children, but you know we who don't have children in the school districts We should it's we're still involved with it because it's about is what we pay our taxes on and it's how we're looked at as a community and so even having This these articles about what's going on in the school board that is encouraging people to be involved and to understand what's going on, even if you're not a parent of a kid in the school right now. You're still paying taxes on That's the, right. that school. I imagine the school is the bulk of the taxes. In I think Harpswell. it is. Yes. I think it is, yeah. As most towns. Yeah. Like that. Can you talk about the actual producing of the newspaper? 
Sure. Um, With, um, you'll look at Sue. Sue will yes, yes. Can okay. you please tell me, Janice, yeah, about yeah. the actual production of the paper? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's a 24 page paper. Um, we thought maybe we would go down in pages during the winter time because it's based on how much advertising we can get, but we've gotten through the, the hard winter months and keeping it at 24. Um, we have, uh, again, Sam Allen is our admin, but he also does the layout, though JW is learning. He's going to be doing the layout, too. We all, we all learn because we're backstopping everybody else, but we try to sort of set up the ads first. Um, we have a deadline of the 15th of the month um, for ads and for content. Um, because it takes us about a uh, staff about a week um, for for me to get the ads in and for JW to edit the the, the content, uh, we try to get it into the mail on the Friday that's the closest to the first. Um, and so JW on Thursdays of that Friday drives down with his van and picks up the papers in South Portland, um, gets them to the post office, and they get they send them out in bulk, and then we all d you know deliver them to different places. Um, so the layout takes probably that the content layout takes about two to three days. Well, it's it's um, we 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 spread it out over two days, but it's um, probably about five hours of, of actual work. Um, the um, the it's it's printed. The newspaper is printed at a plant in South Portland, as, as Janice mentioned, and uh, you know the printing is something to consider for. Um, you know, for, for newspapers starting up, there's there are only uh, only three that I can think of. The printing of newspapers have been, has been greatly consolidated in Maine, and there are only three uh, color newspaper presses um, operating in Maine uh, in uh, South Portland, Newcastle, and Ellsworth um, that I can think of. Um, so that's a consideration. Is the printing uh, associated with the Portland paper at all, or is that where the Portland paper is printed? Yeah, it, it is, and it's owned by the same company. So, okay, and th that's as a lot of newspapers are doing now are taking in printing jobs for the extra revenue. So they already have, in other words, you're using an existing newspaper press. Yes. To, for printing. Yes. Yeah. And we've experimented with the, the newsprint, you know, learned that there's a number of different qualities of levels of quality in newsprint. So we're up to the, we're, we're using the, the most expensive because people are really noticing and especially the ads print out a lot better on the better paper. Um, and, and we actually, that's part of it too, that, that we actively work with the vendors, the businesses and nonprofits to help them with the design of the ads because our view is that the ads add to the hold the quality of the entire thing. We don't charge extra for color like the other editor used to. Um, and again, we often do for, for new advertisers, we provide that free design work and Sam is really good at, at that sort of thing. Um, you brought up the, um, the quality I was going to ask, so thank you, about the photos and they look great in there. They're clear, they're crisp. Whereas in some newspapers, you, see, you get a little bit of that fuzzing. Who do, who, do you have a photographer, or is everybody, every person for himself here taking photos? JW takes a lot of the pictures. We have, a we have two volunteers who, who do photography, professional photography for us um, when, we, when we need. Um, the, it's, it's, it's the quality of the picture, but it's also the quality of the, the printing. Um, and we have had some issues with the, it's called registration when it gets a little bit fuzzy. Um, so we, that's another thing that we, we actively go back to the printer and say, this one was not good. You need to, you need to do better. Um, because, you know, it's, we've, we've lost some, some revenue when, when uh, the advertisers, you know, you can't, you can't see their advertisements, so then we give them free ads and all of that. So we, we've built up a, a pretty good working partnership with a printer, um, but it hasn't, you have to sort of ride herd a little bit on that. Quality control. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't asked that you want to talk about that we haven't brought up? And think of it, it's, um, this has been pretty comprehensive. Um, as uh, one thing, I guess, uh, you asked before about the organization uh, and the human capital and how it all de got deployed. 
Um, Janice said that the board was a very active board, and um, one of the things that we've done that's been very productive with the board is divided into several committees. Mm -hmm. So we have a content committee that works with JW, uh, you know, on the on the uh, on the news out content and the outline of the paper. We have a, a grants committee that, that writes grants for us. We have a marketing development committee that works on the fundraising and the communications to the community. Um, we've got an online working committee. We've got an executive committee and a finance committee. The other piece I wanted to throw out too about the the origin story is the is is the money. Um, we did raise about forty two thousand dollars from these fifteen founders um, before we went out to the community because there was no there there at that point, and we needed to pay for the the reader survey and buying the intellectual capital and the brand from the old paper. Uh, so that was that was something that this group could do and wanted to do. Um, and that was really important in terms of startup costs. And I didn't ask you about the Holbrook Community Foundation. Oh, yeah, we should talk about that. Can you talk about them? Yeah, yeah. They've, they've been fantastic. They're a, a local uh, not-for-profit in the community that focuses on community development. And they serve as a fiscal sponsor for us. And uh, the reason why that's so important is that it takes a long time now to get a 501c3 application and your 1023 application with the federal government approved. You know, the, uh, because of COVID, because of cutbacks in the IRS, it can take anywhere from, you know, 12 to 18 months to get, to get your approval. And so without that approval, you can't operate as a not-for-profit unless you have what's called a fiscal sponsor. And they basically agree to, to represent you. And it's a lot of work on their part. They have to approve your budgets. They have to, you know, uh, process all of your uh, financial transactions. And because Holbrook was able to do this, we could get started much faster than if we were just going through the regular process. And who are they and how did you find them? They're a group here in the community and, and they work on uh, community development projects. Um, and so they were already here and they had worked with other not-for-profits and some people in the community knew of them and told us. And also Deirdre, the president of the <clears throat> board of Holbrook Community Foundation is on our board. Uh, so we had, but it, it also, I just wanted to underscore that too, because it is a lot of work on their part. Um, and we looked into other, and I've, I've worked with fiscal sponsors before. It could be up to 15% of your total revenue that you would pay to a fiscal sponsor. And they're doing it all for free. So um, that's another really big benefit that we've had. Um, you said it took $42,000 originally before you went out. Do you mind if I ask, what does it cost each month to put out this paper between all the overhead? It's, um, it's about $15,000 a month for Did everything. you say 15? Yes, yeah. one five. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? A uh, question for JW. <clears throat> you print the print edition every month, and you're also online. Um, you must update the online when you get stories? Yes. Daily or? Um, a, f a few times a week on, on average. I'd say a, a, little bit, uh, a, a little bit more than every other day on average. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it might be uh, a couple posts every day for a while and then nothing for a few days because I'm working on a story or I'm working on putting together that month's print edition. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not always consistent. Um, working on making it more consistent. On average, it's a it's, um, um, little better than every other day. So it comes to <coughs> deadline time, and you've got a bunch of stuff in the last week that's fresh, but the stuff that came in just after the last edition is kind of, is it stale? Is it, do you weigh it towards the most, most recent stuff? I might on occasion. I, I, yes, I certainly would. Uh, I certainly would give priority to more recent, um, but I give priority to news overall. So usually, when I'm taking something, when I'm choosing not to use something in the print edition, it's something that is not time sensitive. Um, something that you know the news business sometimes refers to as an evergreen story, uh, it's because it's 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 uh, it's uh, good good to use all year and any time. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes you just f throw it all in there. I know how that is. <laughs> yes, sometimes we use every last bit uh, that we have, but I would say that most months uh, I have more, more content that I can use, and yeah, and same same on the 
uh, you know, the, the ads have been coming in so strong uh, because of Janice's work that sometimes the ads uh, push some of my content out. Sometimes you need more that's pages. That's a good problem to have. Yeah. But it's generally been 24 pages every month. It's been 24 pages every month since I started. Um, and uh, we really have to, if we want to, if we want to make it bigger, we would have to go to 32 pages because of um, the way our printer is set up. And uh, we have, n we're not quite ready to do that yet. Um, maybe in the summer. Like maybe if we have, you know, because advertising, there, there are a lot. It's, it's easier to get the ad, ads in the summer because we have more businesses yeah. open in the summer. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, I love, I love layout days because I, I love listening to Sam and JW do it because it's, it's really interesting. It's very creative. They'll be like, well, you know, should, oh, there's a widow here. You know, maybe we should have a couple of lo like spaces between these letters and let's move. I mean, it's very, as I, as I said to, I think Bill Nemitz, I think this is the, the most well proofread or the most proofread um, and produced paper in America, <laughs> but it comes out, you know, yeah. you can see it in the quality. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, I have a question for you. You had talked about trying to get to the younger group. So do you do social media at all? Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. Instagram, TikTok. God knows, everything. <laughs> no, you TikTok, yeah. We're on, we're on Facebook. Um, we are going on Twitter. And as Greg mentioned, we have this um, online working group that we're going to be looking more into that. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's in the that's in the plans. But right now it's Facebook, and I think something like eighty percent of our website visits come from Facebook. Well, I want to thank you, Greg, Janice, JW. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your vision of the Harpswell Anchor with us. We appreciate sure. it. Sure, sure, our pleasure.